uh, the title, Fear and Death. So um, a lot of people are in two kind of different conditions when they talk about active shooter issues. They're either, oh my God, I can't let my kids go to school, I can't get out of the car, I'm so traumatized, or they're just totally oblivious. And so I hope by the, the end of the presentation, I can make everybody kind of go from both ends and just be comfortably paranoid, or at least a little bit more aware <laughs> than they are right now. And as far as for death, hey, it's coming for all of us. But also, I want to offer you some um, mitigation techniques and some things that maybe when you do see uh, the Grim Reaper, you can kick him in the teeth. And so some things we want to talk about as well. So uh, some of our topics we're, uh, we're going to talk about today, um, some definitions, because I think you've got to define things as well as talk about them as well. Um, some statistics on firearms deaths. We're going to talk about the OODA loop. I know I've got some former military guys here who have some understanding of that as well. But that's also important as far as we talk about awareness and things that we can do ourselves. Um, we're going to talk about run, hide, fight, avoid, deny, defend. There are a lot of uh, cookie cutter textbook uh, programs that sadly they aren't all one size fits all. It has to fit for you, your organization, and everything that you do. And we'll talk about those as well. Um, assessment and mitigation. How do we prepare and train for potential active killer events? And then some TTPs, tactics, uh, procedures as well. Um, we're going to come back to this later on, but it's incumbent upon all of you that hopefully by the end of this hour, and I've got a lot to talk to you about as well, you're going to have a paradigm shift. You're going to be thinking one way when you came into this, and hopefully you're going to take a couple things out of this that are going to change the way that you look at yourselves, how you deal with the people in your business, but also how you look at and do things as far as regarding an active killer situation. Um, again, the obligatory me slide, so a little bit about me real quickly. Um, way back in the day, 1990s, uh, U.S. Army soldier, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, left after four years, honorable discharge, became a police officer uh, of all places in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, made detective there and realized I wanted to do um, a lot of other different things and, and move into federal law enforcement. Quick story about Montgomery. It's tough being the damn Yankee when you come down south. And I had no idea because I watched professional football being a, from Ohio, a Browns fan. It was, it's been a tough rock road being a Browns and an Indians fan, but I still am. But so I get to Montgomery and I'm moving into my apartment. And uh, a couple of the guys were moving me in, helping me move all my stuff out of the car. And he looked at me and goes, boy, first of all, I got tired of being called boy, but that's a whole other story. Boy, what are you? I'm going like, all right, what do you mean? I said, you've been here two hours, you've got to commit. And I go, commit to what? They said, Auburn or Bama. Hey, boy, it's two hours. <laughs> and it was that whole, I learned about SEC football. I learned about grits at every meal. There were a lot of fun things, but I kind of cut my teeth in Montgomery as a police officer and detective. And then in 1996, I had the opportunity to take a, a test to become an FBI agent. Um, I thought after I left that test, boy, I'm glad I got a job. But I passed it. And then less than six months later, in September of 1997, I was at the FBI Academy. Uh, 21 and a half years, uh, I've been all over the world. Uh, started off in the Detroit division, worked violent crime, healthcare fraud, intelligence. Uh, I was on a surveillance squad during 9-11. Uh, so I got to uh, go all over the country in support of the Bureau's mission, the counterterrorism counter -terrorism mission against Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. <laughs> in uh, 2007, had the opportunity to come to Detroit, uh, uh, Des Moines here, to the West Des Moines office, and that's how I went the big guy back there with the fire marshal's office and became uh, the Fusion Center agent assigned there for about four or five years and worked a whole host of different violations here. Um, did a lot of extra duties as well, and this is what kind of brings me to the active shooter reign. Um, did four deployments overseas on behalf of the FBI, um, uh, tactical, uh, special agent bomb tech as well, and so all these things kind of helped me bring forward um, some of the experiences that I hope to bring back to you. Um, the reason why I have some expertise, and I do use that term loosely because there's a lot of people that will tell you they know all there is to know, and I'm not that guy. I've just been around and I've seen a few things, kind of like the commercial. I, I've seen a few things, I've done a few things, I know about a few things, and this is one thing I know. So after the tragedy in 2012 at, at Sandy Hook, uh, the Bureau realized that we had to work with local law enforcement, we had to work with first responders and get them the training that they needed to deal from a first responder law enforcement aspect to deal with active shooters. And so they sent 102 tactically trained FBI agents who were swatters and we thought we knew our stuff, snapping towels and doing all that stuff, jumping through windows. And we got schooled a little bit as far as how cops deal with active shooter. 
and the folks down in San Marcos and the ALERT program, and Texas really has kind of a cornerstone on how to deal with active shooter measures, and they've come so far over the years currently refining the process by which they teach law enforcement, and also now including first responders and fire. And also, uh, one little slide here, if you can see that as well too, uh, when I left the Bureau, I'm doing a couple different things here. I'm also running for Warren County Sheriff. That's for 2020, so any Warren County voters here, I'm looking for your vote. <laughs> Gotta get that little plug in there as well. So uh, talking about, again about the FBI and stats, so when we're talking about a mass killing, and I hate using the term active shooter, because again, if, I go, if I'm a hunter and I'm going to hunt my deer, I'm shooting the deer. Or if I'm going to the range to target practice, I'm a shooter. A uh, police officer responds to an event, you know, they're a shooter. I mean, these are law-abiding citizens. We need to kind of change that mythology and they're active killer. You know, these are people that want to take and deprive from you, you and yours. And so what we're talking about here in the mass killing aspect is threes, fours, fives, people being killed or hurt. And if you actually add to some of the events that have occurred over the last 15 to 20 years, and you look at those that are, when you include those that were actually injured in events, the numbers even go higher. So again, if you look at the stats, it's gone up. It hasn't gotten better. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, we're a lot safer than we were, but when you look at some of the stats as far as that though, um, the, the tragedies that have occurred were people with firearms, but it's not just with firearms, knives, vehicles, explosive devices, you know, if there's a way, a will and a way to actually hurt or kill somebody, you know, you're going to see those things. And again, the most important part about this thing is, the last part is, you know, the active shooter incidents, you know, the support and the pre preparation of law enforcement officers and citizens alike though. So one of the things I would bring to you today is, if you don't have an active shooter plan, if you have a business continuity plan and you're talking about fire drills, you're talking about tornadoes, as we, great job from Vermeer and how they had all that thing. If you're not integrating some type of critical event plan to deal with a mass killing event or just a shooting at your business or place of business, you need to kind of, kind of consider that. And I'm glad you're all kind of here to talk about that as well. So Chicago's easy to get picked on and so is Kabul as well, Afghanistan. They make a lot of comparisons on that though. And having spent quite a bit of time in Afghanistan, most recently in 2016, as the special agent bomb tech assigned there, I saw a lot of death I saw a lot of misery, and it's very easy to make the comparison to certain cities. I mean, the stats are that, you know, every three hours and five minutes in Chicago, someone's going to get shot. That's crazy. Every 16 hours, someone dies. It goes on all the time. There are mass shootings every single day in Chicago, but you don't seem to see the same outrage, the, the protests, because, again, of the community that's been affected. But when it affects other communities, there's all this outrage. We've got to do this right now, though, too. But when you look at the stats as far as comparing, for instance, civilian deaths, and also you look at Americans killed. So from 20, 2001 to 2017, and this is going to be kind of hard to read, so I'll, Chicago, there were 8,000 people killed and 2,300 killed in Afghanistan for a 16-year period. Now, again, I think it was Mark Twain talked about stats and how they can be moved, and I'm not going to try to quote Mark Twain too much here. But when you take just one year from there, comparing just civilians versus military personnel, you know, it's still in one year, you've got almost 500 people killed in Chicago and 3,500 killed in Afghanistan. So it's one of those things where, you know, in other locations, in Chicago and Afghanistan, where you have all these mass killings or people being killed in mass, and then nothing's being done or it doesn't affect things potentially here. But here in Iowa, we don't have those issues. So I know some of you are not from native from Iowa, but Iowa, Nebraska, the Midwest, we are a lot safer than, than you might think. So the, the leading cause of death here in Iowa, of all things, heart disease. As you kind of go through the list here, and it's kind of hard probably in the back to read, you've got cancer, respiratory <laughs> diseases, accidents, and all the way in the bottom one, you see intentional self-harm suicide. 1.4 for every um, 10,000 people though. And so that is actually a statistically high number. So when people think about the dangers of firearms that are used in mass killing events, whether it's a, a pistol, a revolver, a rifle, a shotgun, it's very, very small. The vast majority of people that are killed with firearms are due to these self-inflicted uh, suicide issues. And what's really troubling me for me that is those are ones that of course they're inflicting the, the destruction and the sadness they have in themselves on themselves and not doing that on other individuals. But when you go back a couple years here for tragedies that have occurred here in Iowa, 
some of the most recent tragedies of what you would call a mass killing event, where all of a sudden three or more individuals were killed. I mean, you're going back 2008, the most recent one, you know, you've got a father killing his, his, his family. Another situation where you've got now a brother a son killing his family. And then the final one back, one back, I went too many quicks, clicks here. Um, in 2001 in Sioux City, you know, six, and this was a boyfriend killing more of the family. Again, so just because you don't hear a lot about it does not mean we're immune to that though. So if I go back a couple of clicks on that one slide, when you look at suicide as a self-harm, the reason why I think that's critically important to, be, to you all realize is that if that person that decided to commit suicide in Iowa decided to take that anger, that rage, that sadness that was inside themselves and bring it to work, bring it to the job site, bring it to the school, things would have been a lot worse and we would have had a lot more tragedies. And so mental health is one of those things where when you look at how we can help things, and, and Aubrey brought it up as far as the HR component, a lot of you guys are in HR here or have relations in that. The strongest thing you can do, and we'll talk about HR, of how critically important it is in your organization, because if you don't have a native security element within your organization, HR is the way to go. Because again, we have to be good stewards of each other. We have to be good neighbors. Um, whether you like the politics or not, there's a, a saying by an old politician, it takes a village. Regardless, it does. It takes all of us to kind of know what's going on. So if you have people coming in to your organization and your HR people aren't going through their Facebook, they aren't finding out what they're doing on social media. You've all seen right now with what's going on with GM and the strikes. And I talked to this to some folks in the back as well though too. If the HR people and the security people with GM aren't looking on social media at what's going on right now with the strikers, they're wrong because I know they are. Because again, you've got to be able to as an organization protect your employees so you've got to uh, protect your branding. You've got to protect the way that you, your, your employees, and to do that is you've got to be proactive. And one of the ways that you have to do that is within your HR department, you have to have some kind of ability to track and monitor the social media, not just of your employees, but what people are saying about you. That is a critical event that a lot of people just kind of blow off, but ties in directly to the active shooter, active killer event because the statistics that we're seeing right now, whether it's at a school or whether it's location, it's normally not a random event. And all the different events I showed you before about going with uh, the families, the, the person that actually committed these events knew the individual. The majority of time that somebody commits an act of violence, horrendous violence at a business site or a school, they know people in the school, something draws them. Very, very seldom you see just a, a random event. Something brings somebody to that event. And so if you can get ahead of that and you can realize kind of things that are going on, that's critically important. So as we shift focus, what are some things that we can do to kind of be more aware? So Jeff Cooper here had the, the color code back in the day. And in this aspect, they're talking about different conditions, you know, white, yellow, orange, and red. But when Cooper decided to do this, the Marine in him, we got any Marines in here? Who? Oh. No Marines, all right, I'm an Army guy myself, but my dad was a Marine, or still is a Marine, I'm sorry, you're never an ex-Marine, you're always a Marine. But uh, he designed this color code uh, back in the 50s when Cooper designed this to get people to move from a different environment mentally. He was designed this to get the idea that what's it gonna take for me to be able to actually commit a violent act on somebody else? When we take people to our police academies, when we take people to our military, what we do as part of that process and basic training is we break them down and then we build them up. We gotta give them the capacity to, as good upstanding Americans that have good morals, a good compass in their lives, to be able to tell that person now, hey, there's the enemy here, we gotta kill them. We gotta shoot them, we gotta do whatever it takes, whether it's pulling a trigger, whether it's dropping a drone strike on this person. That's hard. We hire our best and brightest in our military and also we want that for our law enforcement because again, we don't want just random assassins out there because again, law enforcement here is, is to protect and serve you. Your military is here to protect and serve all of you and that is very hard to do. So again, this is also considered as far as how do you get yourself to a point where all of a sudden you are actually considering to commit an act of violence in protection of yourself or somebody else. And for the majority of people, they go throughout their entire lives and never consider, hey, what could I could potentially do to protect myself, to protect my coworkers, and especially my family. What are those links? And one of the things I wanna tell you is if you don't have that conversation with yourselves, if you don't rehearse certain things, 
you have to have a relationship with violence. Violence is a tool. Good guys use it, bad guys use it. But if you just say, oh, it's, I can't bear to think about it, it's too much. When the time comes for you to take personal responsibility and do what you have to do to survive a critical event, you will freeze, you will fail, and you will die. I'm just telling you that's the reality of what's gonna happen. You cannot wait for somebody else to save you. You've got to do the things that you can based upon your physical, mental, spiritual, whatever that looks like, or have a plan. You just can't go into these things thinking it's gonna to happen to somebody else, it'll never happen here. Um, as part of that though, uh, the color scheme and animal. So one of the things I teach people, and again, I wanna kinda of give you some skill sets that you can take away, you can share this with anybody else, is how often do we get up in the morning, take our shower, have our oatmeal or our eggs or whatever it is, kiss the loved ones goodbye and go out the door, we get into our car and the next thing you know, I'm in front of my computer screen and I'm typing. How did I get from home to work? Or worst case, you see the people out there, they're jogging with the earphones in. And I understand people want to listen to their music, but they're totally tuned out of what's going on. I don't have my phone, but that damn phone is the worst thing ever for most of us. It's the worst thing ever for most of our kids because they're so focused in on this. They can't have a conversation with somebody. Look, hey, Brian. Chris. How you doing, Chris? Doing well. That's hard for most kids just to do that, to introduce themselves. But that's also one of those things that you have to do at work. And I'll get back to this as well, is again, going back to that takes a village idea, you've got to have that accountability on the job site. You've got to have that accountability of being human with each other. Because again, it's, it's so sad where my, my son came home and I was telling him the other day, he's a senior over at IHS, Indian Old High School. And one of the running jokes at the high school is, is hey Chris, I just want to let you know you're safe for me today. You're safe from me today. Now think about how horrible that is. The kids in school are joking about, and the reason for you don't understand, if some of you may not understand the terminology of you're safe from me today, you see some of the memes on social media, is basically that if I'm gonna commit an act of violence today, if I'm gonna bring a weapon into this school, Chris is safe because he's my buddy. How horrendous is that for our kids? Think about that. You're safe from me today. Who jokes about that? But that's the kind of climate we're in right now. So that's one of the things that people are, it's, it's, it's very disturbing that we've got that. And I know if it's going on at IHS, it's going on in your kids' schools as well. Going back to the color scheme and the animal. So how do you pull yourself out of that though? How do you build some, some basic awareness? So one of the things I teach when you get up in the morning, do two things as you're going to work. Pick your favorite animal or pick your worst animal. Could be a parakeet, could be a dinosaur, who knows what it's gonna be and pick a color any kind of color scheme, and then what you start doing is I'm gonna count the number of times as I'm driving, I'm looking for, I, for some reason I always default to the, the stupid purple dinosaur, Barney. I don't know why my kids used to watch that, so I'm always looking for Barney to come out behind a car or you know flying from the air. But again, what it does is I'm looking for the purple dinosaur. I'm looking, I'm scanning, I'm doing my figure eight as I'm driving. I'm bringing myself out of my head, out of, hey, I just got in a fight with the wife, the kids. I got a flat tire. I got this meeting I've got to go to. No, I'm focused in on right now. And that's the one thing that you can very easily do and you'll catch yourself because halfway through the drive, and I challenge all of you to do this tomorrow, how far you can actually go and think about that purple dinosaur. Because again, chances are most of you won't get all the way to work and still think about that dinosaur because something will cut in. It'll be a radio station or it'll be something going on though. Radio's great, but pretty soon with all these bells and whistles in our car, we lose that awareness. So that's an easy thing that you can bring to yourselves as well, and that's something that you can do as well. But again, going back to Cooper's Codes, again, it also talks about you know, white, yellow. Most people are in white. They walk around oblivious to everything in their day. You need to be in yellow for most of the part of the day. You can't be so amped up that you're all like, oh, what's going on? I'm hiding, I'm, I'm doing stuff. But at the same time, I've gotta be looking at people. I've gotta be assessing people, seeing what's going on, looking in someone's eyes. So I know Chris, and they do that, 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 that uh, thing, how you memorize someone's name. I say Chris three times. I'll never forget, I do it one more time. I got the third time I'm gonna get Chris. I'll never forget his name again. But again, that's, I'm making a connection with Chris. And again, so those are things that you wanna do in your life is make connections with people, but also, Spotting and assessing people in your work site too, is you wanna make connections with the people where you're at and also where you're gonna go at. So a lot of you work in the, in, the, in the construction field here and you're going to different job sites. So as part of that, and we're bringing back HR as far as being in that condition, you got, hey listen, I've gotta to go to 123 Anywhere Street 
and work this job. I've got to put this up, I've got to build this. If your HR people aren't reaching out for or you have no knowledge of the location, not just the weather, because weather is real important, but hey, how many calls of service for, for thefts? How many issues with crime are going on in that area? There are certain things that you can do as far as a checklist to keep your people safe when they go to a job site. Those are critical things you can do, and it just takes a little bit of time. But also, if you've got a big construction crew that's gonna be somewhere for two weeks, hey, swing by the PD or the SO, the Sheriff's Office, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to abbreviate, or Police Department and say, listen, hey, I'm gonna be at this job site on one, two, three, anywhere. Hey, are they having issues with, with gangs, with thefts, with, with whatever's going on? Know what's going on, because again, that's gonna give one more layer to give your people some safety and some knowledge that, hey, things are going on. Have that, res um, not just responsibility, but that communication with local law enforcement. But again, ideally you're going from white to yellow to orange to red. Ideally, you can't live in orange and red. It's too taxing. Because in the red, you'll see one of those things as well. You're basically shutting down. You're already in the critical event. So the OODA loop. This is, uh, applies to so many things in life. I think it's important. And whenever I do a talk on anything, I always want to bring the OODA loop in. So Major John Boyd, probably the greatest fighter pilot no one knew. Everyone knows about Snoopy and the Red Baron. You need to know about, more about the OODA loop. So uh, the last major thing that people don't realize is that during the Gulf War, he was the archetype or arch architect of the Gulf War strategy with Schwarzkopf in, in, in our, uh, on our victory in the Gulf War. But pretty much, it, it's a process by which you can evaluate anything. So you can apply this to your, your job site, you can apply this to interactions with other individuals. And again, observe, orient, decide, and act. So why is it important? So again, in a critical event, your reaction time is critically important. Because again, my buddy comes through the doorway and all of a sudden, oh, he's got a gun. I don't know this guy, or maybe I do, maybe I do. But I know for the fact that all of a sudden, hey, he's had some issues with drinking. He's had some issues with his wife. And all of a sudden, I see him walking through the bell, by the bell right now, and now he's got a firearm in his hand. Again, so I, I can't believe, why would he bring a gun to work? I don't understand that at all. And again, you start processing all these things because I've never thought to myself that, that he could do that. So again, the reaction time, because I'm observing, what am I gonna do? So unknown versus known stimulus. And also Hicks Law, two things I wanna to bring together. So if I've got a lot of opportunities to do certain things, the more opportunities or the more stimulus that I can react to one thing, I'm saying that wrong. Hold on, I wanna say this, it's the easier way to say this. So Hicks Law simply states that the more opportunities to do a variety of things to do one thing ah, that's, that's, that's still the wrong way I want to say that because it's a really simple concept so I'll do judo I'm a judo player and so again when I play judo I've been doing it since I was 13 for instance if somebody comes in and they're a big leg sweeper so again I know a variety of different ways to, to, to counter an effect it's like a, a wrestler we got some wrestlers here as well though they want to go in for a, a two a two-legged grab they want to take my leg out the two so I know five or six different ways to be able to stop that attack. But the problem is I know five or six different ways to stop that attack. If someone's gonna go for a kind of a guillotine or a head choke or something like that though, I know five or six different ways to take care of that though. The more ways I know how to deal with things are great to know a variety of things, but then again, when I do that observe, orient, decide, and act, when I process all that, the more things I've got to process, the harder it becomes. It's why driving is so easy now after years and years of driving. We understand where all of a sudden we're driving the car. I know where the lights are at. I know where the brake's at. But you throw in the anti-millennial device to keep your car safe. You throw a stick shift at somebody. You throw a stick shift at a 16-year-old right now, that car's not going anywhere because <laughs> they can't figure it out. It's too much to process. They only know is key on, gas on. They can't figure out, okay, I've got a gear, I've got a clutch, I've got to do all those things. So in a sense, that's what kind of Hicks Loss talks about. Is again, one, if I'm not familiar with it, but if I've got all these variables, it takes longer to process. And those are one of the things that you can apply that to a variety of different things, but especially in a mass shooter situation. Because if you give your employees, and this goes to your, your business continuity plan, well, for a tornado drill, we're gonna meet over there. For the fire drill, we're gonna go over there. So again, what you want to try to do is you build your business continuity plan, you want to make it a critical event plan. You want to put all the things together for your fire, your tornado, how you deal with critical events, all these things, and marry them together as much as you can for one, one plan. Because again, you want to give your employees at the job site things to do if an event happens and make it easy. Because again, too many plans, too many options. You want to try to limit the options and make it very simple. 
Uh, again, going back to the denial and emotional filter, that's simply nothing more than, like I said, you see Bob coming in after having a couple of beers, but you know him, he's your best friend. There's no way in the world he'd bring a gun in here. There's no way in the world he would be, he would hurt me or somebody else in here. But again, you've got to be able to trigger and figure out these things where you can't deny that. Because again, when you build that emotional filter in there, that somebody brings that weapon into this, this building, you've got to think bad things are happening. You've got to think about what you're going to do and not having to process all that though. But again, when you do mental rehearsals, when you do tabletop exercises, when you actually think about, all right, I'm sitting at my desk right now. I've got time between a meeting here. I know where all my eggs is at. I'm situationally aware. What would I do right now if I'm standing in front here and someone comes in with a gun? What would I do? How many people actually think about that right now at work? You need to think about that. You need to have the plan. You can't be the deer in the headlights going, uh-oh, now what do I do now? And you hit the deer. These are all things that you've got to have planned ahead of time. So again, some things you're looking for, and this is things that you could um, make a copy of this and you could put it at the front desk. But again, these are some um, ideas. This is um, from the Israelis, and we do it as well too, and it's kind of hard to read, but things that you're looking for, for that are out of the norm with somebody else. So again, situationally aware in the business, in the work environment, at school when you drop the kids off, you've got to be spotting and assessing. You've got to turn the radio off, you've got to tune into kind of what's going on, and look for things that don't match. Look for things that are out of place. There's a real great book, and I didn't put the title on it, but it's called Left to Bang. It's written by a Marine, and it's about their hunter program as far as when they're overseas. And they profile attributes, not racially, not by the color of the skin, not by their creed, not by what they do, but by their activities and how they actually move and what they do differently than other people. So again, what you've got to do is develop that ability, that awareness, that when you see somebody that's against the norm. So a couple of things they talk about here, oversized or loose fit clothing, you know, repositioning the weapon, the confirmation, the touch thing. So I'm just curious, besides myself, who else has a firearm on today? There's two, there's three. Now looking at me, do you guys realize I have a firearm on now? Who, who knew before I said a couple? Well, you help you guys know me. And you know, I never go anywhere without a gun. But I would challenge all of you though, so a lot of people on, on the weapon, but why do I carry a gun every time, everywhere I go? It drives my wife crazy. We're just gonna go to Walmart and I go, well, I might forget my wallet, but I'm not gonna forget my firearm. And the reason why is I don't wanna be that guy at McDonald's, at Walmart, when all of a sudden something breaks bad. And it's not because I'm a badass. Even when I think maybe sometimes I am. At least my wife tells me, you think you are, Brian. But again, I think, you know, I've done this job, you know, with government service for almost 30 years. Between my time in the military, police officer, you know, FBI agent, you know, I, I think you have to develop kind of a warrior ethos. And again, I live that though. So even though I don't carry the badge anymore and I've got a retired one, I think all of you have the capacity to be a warrior, but not everybody wants to do warrior, excuse my language, Nobody wants to do warrior shit when it's time to do warrior shit. And what I mean by that is simply is when it's time, when the rubber meets the road, when you've got to do things, each one of you could be a teacher warrior. You could be a construction warrior. Because again, you value your lives. You value the lives of each one of around you. And so you've got to develop the skills to help you get those critical events though too. And so why do I carry a firearm? Because again, I'm not going to be a victim. I can't even conceptualize in my head laying down for somebody because it's never going to happen. There's a, a meme that comes out where it talks about all the things that you would do if you were in a bad situation. And to paraphrase, the last thing that I would do is there's gonna be a pile of brass around me and I'm gonna be with stumps as I'm beating the people off or whatever it takes. Because I'm gonna go full on walking dead and I'm, I'm gonna be the last guy to go. It's not gonna happen to me. But that's what you gotta have. So when I teach firearms to um, the cops and also to civilians, you start off and I can teach anybody here how to fire a firearm, whether it's a long gun, sub gun, shotgun, pistol, and there's a target down there. And I teach the stance and how you're coming in through there, and eventually people become really good at shooting holes in things. After a certain amount of time, maybe a week or two weeks, we keep going back to the range, I start using targets. I'll put like a happy face to kind of break up the momentum, and then pretty soon I'm doing pictures of individuals. I'm doing hostage targets. But I want to have that emotional content that I'm not just shooting a piece of paper. What I'm doing is that's an individual that is trying to take away my life, my kid's life, my partner's life. And again, I have got to build that emotional content because like I was saying earlier, when we train the military, we break them down and build them up. It's very hard for all of us rational, comparing, or compassionate individuals to actually want to kill somebody. 
It goes against our nature. It goes against our humanity. But again, so, but you have to think about that because I know a lot of people, and I've seen it over and over again, you know what, they're great. They're IPSC shooters, you know, they're down there putting the rounds and they're making nice holes and targets. But when push comes to shove, when I got to look at Chris in the face and realize, you know what, Chris is now between me and my family, to be able to engage that person with lethal force, to be able to do the things that I've got to do to stop him, a lot of people can't do it. But again, that's okay. But you've got to have that conversation with yourself before a critical event. You've got to know, it doesn't do you any good to carry a firearm if all of a sudden you're just going to not use it, which is not I mean it gives you some safety, but again, if you're going to carry the firearm, you've got to be able to not only utilize it, carry it safely, covertly, and we could talk all day about open carry versus concealed carry, because again, on the open carry, I'm not going to advertise to the world, even though it's well within your right, and I'm a big fan of the Second Amendment, um, you're better off concealed. Be silent but deadly. But again, this is something that you should have a, a conversation with any kind of reception staff that you have, and you could have this um, and train this and put that up because you're looking for certain things, again, that don't fit the norm. You're not profiling people, you're profiling what they do, their behaviors, their attitudes, how they're acting. Those are things that help build that awareness that go against the grain. So there's a couple different um, active uh, shooter or mass killing type of practices and, and in a sense they, they come down to a couple different ideas. And, and the first thing that I would tell you is you have to do something. And so one of the things you've also got to realize is you've got Kinsler here, you've got other, you've got uh, not La Quinta, what's the, it's Perkins right next door. You've got a lot of businesses in here as well, though, too. So wherever your business is located at, what you have to do is, hey, start knocking on doors, whoever the CEO is, the president, is get to some of these local businesses and have a conversation of, hey, listen, we're doing our business um, continuity planning. We're talking about mass killing events. What do you guys do? What do we do? Because again, it helps law enforcement, it helps each other in a community if you're kind of all on the same sheet of music. I'm not saying you gotta do what they do across the street, but I'm saying is you gotta be aware because again, one, why not reinvent the wheel? There are a lot of free services out there. There's FEMA and we'll talk about some other things. But again, if your organization is not talked to your PSA, which is your, um, oh, I know I do, I forget the damn acronym again. Your protective service, um, agent. Basically, FEMA has a federal PSA uh, director for this region. It used to be Phil Pitson. Now I think it's Mike Judge. He's a former uh, uh, Navy SEAL. Great guy. I've not met him, but I know him by reputation. Super guy. Well, they can come in and they can do a vulnerability assessment. You've got Homeland Security Emergency Management in uh, Johnston. And also here in Story County, you also have Native Emergency Management personnel here too. That will help work you through a plan to help you exercise what to do in case of an active shooter event. No one out here is by themselves. But again, you have to engage people and ask for help. And there's a lot of free help out there. And there's guys like myself and other people that will actually come and, you know, and give you their expertise as well too. But saying that it's too hard, it's never too hard, and you can never get ahead of things as well too. So a couple of things that through my experience, and definitely stop me if you guys have a question on this. So my military experience as well as that though, so get off the X. So when I was overseas, and, and I was, one of the best missions I had was working with some of the tier one units, we would do this mission called the SSE mission, uh, Sensitive Site Exploitation, where myself and a bunch of the Hoovers would fly in on Chinooks. We would go to various places in the Kandahar province. They would do what they do best. And then afterwards, I would come in and pretty much do a search warrant. I would work on getting fingerprints off those alive and dead. I would take photographs because again, the whole purpose of our guys being over there is to help support the warfighter effort overseas, but also gain valuable intelligence for the FBI, but also for the warfighter. But one of the things that we would do on these Chinooks is we'd, you know, we'd fly in and there, there was, we'd helicop helicopter attack force. And so we'd land usually on the Y. And so for the non-military folks, it would mean, it'd mean a long hike in. And so ideally, you want to be somewhere and then go to where the bad stuff is happening. In a mass shooter event, you're on the X. You're in the kill zone. So again, a lot of things, a lot of business and I would talk to teachers as well, I would say, listen, you've got teachers here right now. You entrust them with your most valuable possession in the world, your children. You talk to them, 
you give them education, you give them away from your standpoint as a teacher, the very best and bright, brightest. And now, as an administrator, you're gonna tell this teacher, this is the only way that you can do it, instead of all of a sudden, hey, you've got a big school like, say, Valley, here at, uh, in West Des Moines. I think it's almost 2,000 students. So if all of a sudden you're aware of, through communication that there's a, a mass shooting event in the west side, does it make sense to lock that down instead of get those kids out of there? Does it make sense if all of a sudden a building like this, if all of a sudden we hear shots in the front of the building, I try to close some of this glass up and say, all right guys, let's be quiet, let's turn our cell phones off, let's not say anything, instead of you know, breaking a window, finding another egress ag exit out though too. So options are important, knowing your environment, knowing your building. But again, not one size fits all, and just from my experience, it's better to get out of harm's way. When I'm teaching combatives or, or self-defense tactics, the first thing I ask is, hey, Chris, what kind of shoes you got? He's like, what kind of shoes do I have? I said, because run foo is the best thing you can do in a fight. If I don't have to fight anybody here, I'm gonna run away. Why do I wanna get involved with something? So if I can always get out of the place where bad things are happening, that's good for me, that's good for my family, and it's easy to teach people how to run away. That's always the best option to get off the X. Uh, Survivor Man, Les Stroud's one of my favorite Canadians. Eh? Hey, it's a joke there anyway. But one of the things he does is he knows so much about so many things, but he's got so many life skills. And so life skills as far as who here is CPR certified? Awesome. How many people have been to the Stop the Bleed class? Good, two. So again, three classes that folks like myself or other people can provide to your organizations. Because in a critical event, when the cops come through that door, when there's hopefully you're gonna have four or five, but chances are in a smaller community where you might be at, it might be one or two, they're not stopping to plug your hole, Chris. What they're doing is they're gonna to try to kill the killer and they're gonna do everything they can. So you might be bleeding out there for a while. So what are the skills that you have native to yourself that you know how to make a tourniquet if you don't have one? You know how to plug holes, you know how to do CPR. These are all life-saving skills that you can learn on your own to help you move from that, that victim mentality into being a warrior. Um, pick up basketball and communication. It's critically important. We're teaching cops as far as, hey, we've taken a room, for instance, and we've got bleeding people around, we've got things going on. It's like anything else, though. Don't wait for someone else to tell you what to do. Everybody here is three times seven. In a critical event, everybody needs help. Everybody needs a job, but we all have to know what the jobs are. Some of the greatest sports teams in the world and some of the greatest organizations in the world, they know the job overall. They know what people need to do. So if someone comes down going, hey coach, send me in. I may have never, never been the quarterback, but you know what? I can throw a mean ball down, you know, being able to know different positions. So again, when it comes down to, that's why it's very good to have a variety of individuals in your organization trained in various things, but also in firearms. I know Kinsler has some very uh, pro second amendment folks here. But again, knowing having a day, and this might sound kind of crazy, at your business, hey, this is a pistol. This is how it works. This is the end where things come out of it, the freedom seed, and this is where you put information in. Or however you want to look at that. This is what a shotgun does. This is, and just to have some familiarization with all of a sudden it's there. Because again, also, besides all of you here, you might have visitors, you might have children, you might have something here where you might have a weapon here, and at least knowing how to use it. Because God forbid if all of a sudden something happens and people are piling on somebody and the weapon's free, I don't want the bad guy to get that weapon. Now I maybe just take that and put it somewhere else, but it may be come to a situation where I don't own a firearm, I don't like firearms, I hate firearms. But you know what? I know how to use them. Who's seen Quigley Down Under? A couple of people? One of my favorite all-time movies. And, and, I digress on the, on the film, but there's a scene in there where all of a sudden Quigley down under, played by Tom Selleck, is this great sharpshooter down in Australia. And in a, in a sense, he goes down there for a job shooting varmints, and it turns out they want him to start shooting the local Aborigines. And the whole time he's got this old sharps rifle. And so the protagonist is played by Alan Rickman. And in, in the end of the day, it's, it's a gun battle because Alan Rickman, even though he's from Australia, play, I know I'm going off on tangents here, but plays this gunfighter where all of a sudden now he, he thinks quickly, you know, played by Tom Selleck, is just a rifle guy. Well, all of a sudden, now they get into a gun battle, and he just shoots him with his 45 or whatever it is, and he says, you know what? I didn't say I didn't know how to use it, the weapon, in a sense, though. So again, knowing weapons, knowing uh, medical um, EMS, knowing how to do me medical things is very important. Uh, the Daredevil and Sheepdog Principle, um, big fan of, of the comics way back in the day, read a lot of it, but in a sense, having that awareness, 
and having that daredevil philosophy. For those of you that don't know the comic and sense, he's a comic book hero, but more importantly though, he's got this, like this radar sense. But what more importantly is he's aware. He's aware of his surrounding. He knows what's up. Like for instance, this building here, we've got an upper level and a downward level. So again, when I'm looking and I'm doing clearing or I'm looking for awareness, I'm trying to take in everything that's going on here. I take in my exits. I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm aware of what I have around me, which is critically important. Uh, a harmless man is not a good man. A very good man is a very dangerous man who has it under control. Um, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. This is one of his quotes. I wish I could grow the beard like that guy. I'm just, I'm beardless. I try every once in a while, I just get stuffy. But again, it's critically important. And it applies to man or woman. So again, you have to have certain skills. You cannot allow others to do the vital work for you to go home every single night and put it in other people's hands. The biggest person that has the ability to control what happens to you, to your loved ones, is sitting right there in those seats with you. So again, you've got to develop the skills that you possibly can to make that happen. So again, what are some of the things that you do when you build your business um, continuity program? I mean, again, you've got to build in all these different things. But the critical thing that I want you to build in is, is have that conversation with your HR people. When you send people out to the field, what's the checklist that you do that keep people safe? Do you coordinate with local law enforcement? Do you know what the weather is? I mean, long term. Um, these are all certain things. Do you make sure that your people have the proper medical, medical equipment, but also a f a fire extinguishers, all these different things when you send people out. These are critical things and you build that in there as well too. When you hire people and fire people on your HR people, do you say, listen, hey, Chris, I wanna hire you for my business. Hey, would you mind putting your computer on? And uh, by the way, log into my, your Facebook account. I'm just curious. Now, a lot of people are going, you can't look at their Facebook. Well, why can't you? You're gonna hire them for your job. They're gonna represent you. And I beat my kids up all the time and say, wait a second, just because you can put it on Facebook doesn't mean you should. Because again, once it goes on there, once you snap that happy snap, once you write that comment, as we've seen recently, it's with you forever. But that also goes to knowing who you're hiring. It also goes with following the social media as far as what's affecting your business. And not just your business, but your competitors. Because you want to find out they may just get your name wrong and blame you as well as a group. So those are things to consider, and you've got to build that within your organization and your threat mitigation plan. Preparing, we already talked a little bit about CPR and Stop the Bleed. I do the whole uh, Daniel song there with the, the, the martial art thing. Um, I've been a lifelong martial artist. Um, I say I play at it, but I've been doing it since I was 13. But again, I, I still play. Um, it's harder now. My oldest son is 22, coming up in December here, and at 185 pounds, he's tough to fight these days, so I give him the best I can. And I give as good as I get most days. But again, physical fitness is a key component to what I believe that I need to maintain, not just for my profession as a PI and a consultant, and hopefully future sheriff, but also more importantly, just as a human being. You gotta be able to move stuff up. You gotta be able to pick stuff, put us up down. But again, I, I build these skills and I work on these skills. Uh, firearms, it's important to have the firearm skill. For me, it is. Maybe not for you, it is, it's not. But again, knowing how to use things is critically important. Uh, moving off to the side there, I talked a little bit about the sign for emergency management stuff and law enforcement. So at your job site, we've got different individuals here. Um, some of you run 24-hour operations. Some work just what you would consider the two shifts. Invite local law enforcement in. It's the old thing where they talk about, you know, having coffee and donuts at the place, but cops like a place to retreat to. They like a clean restroom. The fire people like, well, you luckily hear it with Kinsler, you've got the fire department right across the street. But in some of your locales, though, invite the police officers in. Invite the first and second shift patrol sergeant or lieutenant in, give them a tour of the building. So the first time he comes in for a critical event, or the first time EMS, because we were talking about this, up this right now. So again, I'm not sure if they've got, you know, some stairs up there. If all of a sudden you've got somebody that's maybe a little heavy or breaks a leg, how are they going to get him down them stairs? I'm sure before EMS decided to come out here, they'd like to know how are we going to circumnavigate these stairs with a gurney. These are all things ahead of time that are important. Where all it takes is, hey, you guys mind coming over a cup of joe? We want to show you the place. We've got some new improvements here. We kind of want to figure what's going on. Because again, bringing those people in. But also, we've got a lot of glass here. In some buildings, you don't have that. So if your organization, you've got a heavy fortified steel structure, knowing how to, like when I look at a door, I just don't see a door. I look at it, how am I gonna secure that? How am I not gonna secure that with, with native things? We've got a representative of the fire marshal's office back there, and he'll tell you as well as I will, there's certain things, and you see all these aftermarket gimmicks that can secure a door. 
under a lot of Iowa code and other states' codes, they're illegal to even have in the building. So again, having that communication, not just with your fire EMS, but talking to the fire folks that do the code for your building, knowing what you can and cannot do to secure your building is critically important as you build your, your um, continuity plan. And then also the emergency management folks. Wherever your emergency management folks are, invite them in, tell them you're, you're building your, your business continuity plan. We're talking about tornadoes, we're talking about fires, we're talking about active killer events. What can you do to help? There's a lot of free help out there as well, the two. Because the last thing I want to be is down on my hands and knees. You can play dead. It worked for a couple of folks at Virginia Tech and a lot of folks it didn't work. So again, those are things that you've got to consider as you're doing all your planning as well, the two. I'm running out of time here, about 20 minutes left though too. So preparation training for violent encounters, um, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. I can't tell you enough, and I'm sure Vermeer will talk about, you know, they were so successful in what happened when they had that, that tornado is because they exercised the plan. And so I did it before I left uh, emergency management. I worked it briefly for a little bit before a, a change in leadership decided they didn't need my services. But I did a, a tabletop exercise for, for Grandview University. And literally what we did was we took the auditorium and each of the buildings, I put the maintenance individuals, the teachers, the staff at each of these tables. And then I did a, a virtual walkthrough of the plan as far as, okay, at 7 a.m. on a normal day and on Monday, you know, this event occurs and what do people do? Because you've got to start off with that tabletop, the high level stuff to get an idea of, hey, these are things that we're going to do because even in that conversation, one of the biggest things that we talked about was the reunification program. A couple of the professors there at Grandview are like, why am I worried about reunification? I'm going like, wait a second. I'm putting my kid through Grandview, and all of a sudden I hear on the radio, shots are fired, kids are down. The first thing I'm doing, I'm getting in my car, and I'm going 110 miles an hour to Grandview, right up to the, the gates there, because I want to know what's going on with my kid. So you better have a plan of where they're going to go, what's going to happen, and the whole media thing as well, though, too. As you're building your business, business continuity plan, you've got to figure out the 24-hour news cycle. You're going to have CNN, Fox, you're going to have all these people. Where are you going to put them? Who's your PIO? Who are the people that are going to talk to the media while you're doing all these things? These are all things that you've got to build. And whether it's a, a tornado or a fire, you've got to have that, that media response immediately in mind when you build that plan. Um, and the KISS principle, keep it simple. Try to marry as many of those critical event plans together. Um, that's going to be critical in, in building that, that whole thing. So this is the thing I offer as well besides the, 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 the color scheme. I call it the bucket of life. And so going back to the idea of when the law enforcement comes through that door, they're going to kill the killer. That's their whole goal. But as they're doing that though too, you're dealing with what's going on. You could be in a back room, you could be in a closet, you could be in a storeroom. And so what's an easy way that you can help yourself out though? And so this is something I kind of put together. I'm, I'm, I think I'm the only person that does this. And as I put this out, it's free, and I'm sure other people are going to want to do this too. So you look at the schematic at the top end of the corner. What you do as an organization, this is very easy to do. I could build this for you, but you could build it yourself. You go down to Lowe's, you get your black bucket. You put in combat gauze. You put in a tourniquet. Again, I know a couple of you have been to the Stop the Bleed class. You figure out, hey, what's the normal maximum occupancy for a room? We'll say you normally have like 15 people in there you usually need double the number of tourniquets. So you're going to stuff this thing pretty fast. Because again, in a critical event, you might be stuck in that room for two minutes. You might be stuck in that room for 20 hours. There's been all kinds of things because again, they're not going to give the all clear a lot of times for, for EMS, even tactical EMS, to come into that site to treat people. So you better have the AED. You better have something to treat wounds. You're going to need, and this sounds as, as disgusting as it sounds, you're stuck in a, in a room with no restroom. Those things do occur. What are you going to do? What are you gonna do, use a corner? You got a bucket. There's a lot of things you can use a bucket for. A roll of toilet paper, food, water, power bars. On the top of the lid, what I suggest is you put the schematic for your building. So all of a sudden, especially if you've got visitors in your building, you make sure that you put all these buckets in the northwest corner of your building, of all the floors. So you know no matter what, and you communicate that with fire and EMS. Because when the fire department comes through, or if you've got a large building or the cops come through, they know, hey, we've always got medical supplies over here. And the great thing about this is you've got your, your communication. And Aubrey talked about with, uh, with the tornado and some of the issues they were having communicating and inoperability with local law enforcement. But if all of a sudden you're on a generic uh, shortwave radio or, or you've got a radio capacity, that gives you communication when all the radios or the phones go out, though, too. Plus, also, you can talk to other floors and kind of figure out what's going on. But having that schematic of all of a sudden says, hey, I'm here in this building here. If I want to get out, I go this way. 
I could also put breaching gear in there if all of a sudden I need to clear a window. But knowing how to breach a window is important too. It's not just I'm going to take a, 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 a chair and just and dump through it. I may have to break and rake. And knowing how to break and rake a window, it's a skill. Anybody can learn to do it, but the question is do you have things native in that bucket or things in that room to be able to get out of that place? If you're on a second story, do you have rope or some kind of repelling gear? You can put as many things or as few things in this bucket, but those are important things to have. So what is your EDC? EDC is your everyday carry. And so one of the things when I was teaching law enforcement, active shooter, so my wife calls this my, my MERS, my man purse. So I'm not going to get it all out though, but one of the things that we teach an active shooter for, for law enforcement is again, if you don't bring it in, and I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll take it apart at the next break. You guys can look at it. But in here, I've got tourniquets on the outside. I've got water. I've got food. I've got ammo. I've got breaching gear. And one of the things on the side is I've also got a little pouch here. So if all of a sudden I put this over my shoulder, as I'm going into a building here, I've got this. And it seems kind of hokey, and it takes a second. And so now, yes, it says police on it. And so I think... I might get in trouble a, le a wee bit from the local coppers. But the one thing this does is now, as I'm going through and I'm helping out Kinsler, or I'm helping out my place there, as I'm going through here, what's going to happen when shots are fired? Every local copper, every federal copper, every state copper is coming, guns blazing, coming through that door. And if you're doing the right thing as a good Second Amendment person, and you've got that firearm, firearm out and on, and you haven't identified yourself, they're going to think you're the bad guy and shoot you in the back. I'm telling you, it's going to happen every single day. So as you kind of build your plan as far as having people carry, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide as well, though, too, that's a huge consideration is, is marking, is how do you mark yourself as well, though, too. I think I'll probably be able to get out of it, and I'll throw my old the creds at them, but I'd rather have some kind of marking so I keep this with me all the time so at least if something bad happens, they're going to see this and they're not going to mistake me for the bad guy. And that does not mean that the bad guys can't have something like this, but chances are they're not going to. So, kind of fishing up some of the issues surrounding employees with firearms. So, the legality. So, again, Who's going to get sued here in an active shooter or mass killing event at your business? You guys are. I can promise you 100% of the time, there's going to be a grieving family somewhere that's going to say, you didn't do enough. So the question is, do you do nothing? Or do you arm your people? Those are all questions that you've got to have and talk to your lawyer. So bring in your legal counsel, you sit with the CEO, and you sit down going, hey, listen, we can do nothing, or we can arm guys to the teeth and we can arm everybody in we can have bake sales and everyone gets a firearm today as they walk through the door. I mean, you can go to whatever extreme that you want to do. But at the same time, though, have that, you know, that conversation and figure out what works for you guys. So if you guys do decide to arm your individuals, you know, are you going to be open carry or, or concealed? Because, again, one of the things that, and the reason why normally when I give a presentation, I do apologize for no suit and tie or a sports jacket. But, again, when you carry a firearm, and this is one of the things I teach civilians is carrying a firearm is a way of life. It is like growing a hump. It's like growing a second arm or another eye. It's something that has to become a part of you. It has to be native. Because again, if you can't leave it in a purse, you can't put it in a drawer. If you're gonna use a weapon, if you're gonna carry a firearm, it has to be on your person somehow. So again, you have to make that decision from clothing wise. You have to look a little more slovenly if that was the word you wanna look or whatever that looks like. You've gotta have something concealed that it's going to make it look because, again, you don't want to give someone the advantage that they know that you're armed. So that's a huge consideration as far as who, that, who that's going to be in, in your organization. Another uh, consideration as far as for the training aspect is what level of training. You've got NRA training, you've got private training. So again, you have to make sure that the people that you authorize to carry firearms in your business have some type of training as well too, that you can go back to when you do get sued as far as, hey, We've taken them through this basic course, they've gone through ILEA, they've gone through whatever that looks like, that you can document the training that they've done and they kind of know what's going on with the weapon. Because here's the, here's the fact that a lot of management doesn't want to realize is there's a lot of good Second Amendment people out here that are going to job sites, that are coming to work, and even if you tell them they can't bring a gun, they're bringing a gun. I'm telling you, it's Iowa. It may not be Texas, but it's still Iowa. So there are a lot of people that carry firearms all the time. 
But you can put your head in the sand or you can have that conversation with your employees and go, and listen, hey, we don't, as an organization, have a philosophy where we believe in firearms. That's good. And you know the consequences. If you get caught with a firearm on a job site, you're getting fired. But have that conversation. Leave no mystery. Because again, regardless, even if you put that out, there are a lot of folks that are going to carry that weapon anyway. But again, so if you do decide that you, as part of your corporate philosophy, you're going to allow firearms on site, again, training. You're going to designate individuals. Where are they going to keep it? There's, you actually almost need a whole section on just how that's going to work and how you're going to respond. But most importantly, as you look at this, the CCW, that's very similar to the one that I had originally, but it's for the, that the local law enforcement know. That if all of a sudden they come to Kinsler, you've got three or four guys that are Second Amendment gun toters that have already probably taken care of the problem. But again, how they're going to respond to local, local law enforcement, that they're going to be hands up, and all the things that are involved, those are critical things that you've got to train for as well, though, too. Because the one thing we don't want, you guys can see, that's Yosemite Sam up there, is you don't want to be going to the car going, oh, I've got to get my gun, I've got to help out. So all of a sudden now, local law enforcement's coming in, and all of a sudden you're grabbing your gun or your rifle or your shotgun out of your car thinking you're going to help, and you get killed in the parking lot when the cops come up. Because if, if they think you're potentially the bad guy, they're going to put you right in the ground. And you're going to take that room temperature challenge, and you don't want to do that. So this is a, an old, old quote, and I'm going to leave you guys with this one as well, though, too, because my hour is about up here. But, but it's critical that when you look at the quote, and again, as a military guy, as an ex-law enforcement, retired law enforcement guy, I, I don't think it's necessary that anyone do anything special other than what they can. When I had the first picture up there, sometimes we've got to do what we can because we have to. So again, everyone in here has the capacity to be a warrior. Everybody here has the capacity to do the right thing all the time. But you only do the right thing all the time is when you, you train. When you do the things that, that are important to keep you and your, um, in a survival situation. Physical fitness, spiritual fitness, doing all the things, knowing who's there. If you decide to carry a weapon, be proficient with the weapon. If you don't carry a weapon, you better be proficient in first aid or you better have a good pair of jogging shoes. Because you'll be able to get off the X and get out of the situation. But these are all considerations that you have to take every single day because, again, you can't leave it up to the coppers. You can't leave it up to the fire EMS. As an individual you know, um, of a great organization, not just with Kinsler, but other good construction organizations, you owe it to each other. That the most important thing I tell cops you know, is, is when you go to work is you go home at the end of the day. So you build within your business continuity plan. You build the skills, the techniques, the, the things that you need to do to not only just do your job and enjoy your job and enjoy each other because that's important to have that, that family atmosphere, but to, to build the life-saving skills that are going to help you if a critical event happens. I've got about eight minutes. What are your questions at this time? Who are you looking out for? Who, who, who's the shooter? So who is the shooter? Is he black? Is he white? Is he the white national? Is he the Muslim? He could be anybody. Because again, when there's evil intent in someone's life, but again, if you look at like the book I was telling you about Left to Bang, or, or you look at some of the, the, the psychological of, of the, the, the people, they had just had a, done a study of all the different active shooters, and this pertains more to school, but it also applies to businesses as well, is that in 80% of the cases on, on active shooters at the schools, the student, or the person knew the school, they knew the teachers, they knew the environment. And at one point during that previous period, and this is a high number when you look at 80%, they had reached out for a peer. They had reached out for a teacher saying, listen, hey, listen, I'm having issues at home. I'm cutting myself. I'm being abused. And they were shut down. They had issues at home, and the teacher didn't know how to deal with them, or the peer didn't know how to deal with them. 78% of the people that are committing active shooter or active killer events in our schools right now told somebody before it happened. In person, they told it on social media before it happened. People aren't listening. Like when I talked to Chris here before, and I've got your name down the third time. But again, you know, Chris is safe for me though. When someone in your school tells you, or you've talked to your kid, has someone ever said that to you, that you're safe for me? Kids talk. Kids are on social media. If you're not in your kid's phone blowing up, knowing all their passwords, I'm sorry, you're failing as a parent. You're failing as a grandparent. You've got to know. Yeah, it's your phone, but who's paying the bill? If you're paying the bill, you get to see what's in that damn phone. Or else you don't get the phone. 
Get him a flip phone. Go out to, you know, Target or, or not beating up on Target, but just, hey, get him a phone that works. But regardless, that's your responsibility as a parent. And you got to take it lightly. So it's important that you kind of know what's going on though. So it could be anybody. But again, that's why you have profile behaviors and characteristics. You look for the muttering. You look for the thousand yard stare. You look for the things out of place. But I will tell you the statistics are starting to show though that it's going to be someone that knew the building, knew the people, knew what's going on. They reached out for that cry for help. One of the issues that we're having not just in Iowa but across the country is our lack of ability of helping people out that are mentally ill or having depression issues. It's a serious, serious health issue and it's kind of moving over to the point where it's affecting people's lives because again, they're so despondent or sometimes they're just filled with so much evil that uh, they're looking to take it out on everybody and everybody else. You had a question, Chris? Were there any red flags for Sandy Hook prior to that were missed? I think the, in the Sandy Hook study, I think what well, he was from the school, I, I think um, he was definitely mentally ill. Um, it wasn't, and again, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna give NRA the, the props here. This, this, when you look at all the school shootings and a lot of the mass killings, these weren't card carrying NRA members. And again, a lot of people confuse the issue and it's easy from a political situation and I'm not trying to dance around anything, but those people would have got those weapons anyway. The weapons that were, were gotten in all those mass killings um, for the most part were gotten either stolen or legally, or st I mean, these were not, again, you know, mature adults. These were people with mental illnesses. And again, um, there were a lot of situations where, not just in Sandy Hook, but in other situations where law enforcement was notified, but again, the follow-up wasn't done as far as helping out with the mental health of, of that young kid. He was the problem kid because again, too often, and, I, and again, I go back to the it takes a village, how often is it, oh, that's just crazy Joe down the street, or you're in the school, or, or that's just Nancy. She always talks crazy about hurting people or, or cutting things or something, but the problem is nobody wants to talk to somebody else. Nobody wants to take that extra effort to say, you know what, hey, maybe Nancy needs some help. Maybe she needs some counseling. And so again, being a friend, being a human being to individuals, I think does more to stop a lot of what's going on because nobody wants, again, excuse my language, sadly, a lot of people just don't give a shit. People don't care about their neighbor. I mean, think about just going, and I'm not beating up on anybody here, but when you go home tonight and you, and you pull in your driveway, how many people know who the neighbor is across the street anymore? How many people actually have a cookout and invite everybody around? Shoot, we don't even know our neighbors anymore, let alone we know our, the people that we work with at, at work. So again, it really comes down to just being human and caring about each other. And I think that would, if not solve, at least it helps us identify when all of a sudden, if you know people and they're acting different, if they're coming into work and they've had a few too many, and now all of a sudden now they're not saying anything, or they come in with a black eye or a, an abuse situation. Again, you got to reach out. You got to be human. You got to help each other. Anybody else, sir? So for, for a lot of the folks here, uh, we've got uh, you know, construction companies that are uh, going to have crews of four, five, ten people. You know, uh, relatively you know, loosely distributed around small cells and boats. For those crews, what would you recommend? Well, well, first, you know, they, they get into an MRAP or a Bra uh, Abrams. You guys don't know what those are. You did. But anyway, I was making a joke there. You come in with a military. You know, what you do is um, I think you, you start everything with your HR people, and then whoever is the shift boss is you simply start off with that checklist, and you do a mitigation or threat assessment on every job site. And you start off with the big things. You start off with, hey, I get with national. What's the weather the next? I mean, this is a, a two-month job. So I get the, the forecast for the next two months. And then the next thing I do is I find out where that's at. I go to the local police department. And as part of my checklist, I can even do it from the office here. I say, listen, hey, I'm having my crew over at 123 Anywhere Street. Um, can you give me the number of runs in the neighborhood? And what I mean by runs is the law enforcement folks will be able to tell you how many in a square block, how many police calls there have been. But also, I would also call the fire guys too. Say, listen, hey, how many calls for service do you have over here? Because that might be indicative of all of a sudden, a lot of individuals utilize the fire EMS service as free health care. They're in bad shape. They have other issues. They can't afford to go to the hospital. But it might be indicative of issues going around in that neighborhood. Because that leads to, hey, I might have 10, 15, $50,000 worth of equipment or gear on my truck. 
probably, I mean, I'm sure you guys have quite a bit of gear. I don't want it stolen. So I kind of want to know what are the runs in the neighborhood that's going to protect that as well, though, too. Make sure that on all your, your crews, you've got, of course, all the fire suppression gear, but make sure that you've got tourniquets, bandages. You've got an AED. Those are all expensive things at first, but you outfit them that have all that. And additionally, before they go to the job site, you have the, the meeting here, and you make sure annually, you make sure all your guys know CPR. You make sure all your guys know how to do a stop the bleed class, or at least how to put a tourniquet on. Because again, there's more guys, and we just went through the stop the bleed class when I, was, when I went uh, tourniquet stuff and, and, and uh, medical gear with the Bureau when I went to uh, the, the post Sandy Hook. And then the week after that, one of my buddies, Mike Connolly out of Detroit, uh, came across an accident on, on the road. Woman got her leg cut off in a car accident, but he had his, 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 um, his MERS with him. He had all his medical gear, save your life. So again, having that gear and knowing how to do it, those would be some critical things. And also, um, for those of you guys out in the military, you have, as you're doing patrol, if you're infantry guys, all of a sudden you're going from point A to point B, you do certain rally points as far as, hey, you know, if something bad happens, we're gonna meet here. It's the same thing on a job site. You have to pick your job site and you gotta think about, hey, the same thing that, that, that Bruce talked about here. There's the restrooms, if we have a tornado, we're gonna move here. On the job site, as part of that checklist, whoever the boss or the leader of that job site is, hey, you know what, here's the PD, here's the closest, and for SWAT, whenever we had an operation, we would get, before we get to a, an operational matter, we would put in the GPS, where's the closest level one, level two trauma to the SWAT operation? Because I'm worried about one of my guys getting hurt or killed. But uh, job sites are incredibly dangerous. You could have someone get something amputated or punctured. So I may not want to wait for EMS to get her to save my guy. If all of a sudden in my GPS, I've got the back seat loaded out, clear of gear, and all of a sudden one of my guys gets hurt, he gets head injury, or he gets a puncture wound, I can load and go because all I got to do is hit the GPS button and I'm going straight to the level one trauma nearest my job site. But those are all things, and take the time for your, your shift leader, whoever that team lead is, to make the drive from that job site to the local um, EMS or fire department. Because again, that's gonna save lives right there. Those are some really easy things that just kind of thicken out of the box. That's that way when they know they go somewhere and they also have them check in throughout the day. I mean, of course you wanna do your job and not be bothered, but if all of a sudden you've got someone going home because there's someone sick, you know, accountability is, is hugely important as well though too. Knowing where your people are at as well. Any more questions? Hopefully you're like a little less fearful, a little more situationally paranoid, a little bit more aware of stuff going on. And hopefully I gave you guys a couple of skills um, that are gonna help you out. Um, if you'd like, we can chat afterwards. If it's an interest at you or your organization for me to come on out and talk to your folks in HR or your CFO or, or however that looks like I can offer something, please uh, grab a card. I'd love to talk to anybody. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.